Hey everybody, it's Amy again, here to welcome you back to another fabulous Dueling Rabbits Productions video. Today we are continuing on our drawloom journey, taking a fine wool damask scarf from inspiration to finished object. In my previous video, Planning and Beaming a Drawloom Warp, we designed our project, wound the warp, and beamed it onto the loom. Our cliffhanger ending left us here, with 690 warp ends knotted and hanging off the back beam, ready for the next step. Today we're going to put those ends through their paces by threading them through two sets of heddles, slaying them through the reed, and tying them onto the cloth beam. While we're at it, we'll even tie up our lambs and treadles. It's a marathon day, so let's get back to work. The first thing we have to do is thread our pattern leashes. These are the groups of heddles on our pattern shafts, which, when raised, will give us the warp emphasis blocks of our pattern. If you are new to damask weaving and would like to understand better the role of these units in pattern creation, I suggest you check out my previous video, Drawloom Mechanics 101, for an exhaustive discussion. Each leash consists of six pattern heddles, one for each warp end in our six-thread unit weave. These heddles are all connected by a single lingo, which weights the leash and causes it to snap back to neutral when it is no longer needed. I've chosen to use six heddles for my six-thread units, but this is not always necessary. For finer threads, like 32 cotton, for example, multiple ends can be threaded through a single heddle with great success. In their final position, the leashes on their pattern shafts are hung towards the front half of the loom, behind the ground shafts and quite a way forwards from the back beam in order to give a good shed. But we do not typically thread the leashes in their final position, nor do we thread them in their final configuration. Instead, we gather the leashes together and hang them in front of the back beam. They are placed on a temporary headling bar to make threading easy and then transferred to their pattern shafts much further along in the process, after the warp has been tied onto the cloth beam and placed under tension. I personally consider the transfer of the leashes from the headling bar to the pattern shafts to be one of the most vexing procedures in all of drawloom weaving. For a narrow piece, it's not too challenging to work from a single bar. But for wider pieces, or pieces requiring complex arrangements of leashes, I find the process confusing and stressful, and often make mistakes at redistribution time that can throw my whole arrangement out of whack. So I like to think ahead and thread pattern heddles in a way that makes it as straightforward as possible to transfer them onto their respective pattern shafts later on. For a large piece with borders, for example, I might situate my leashes on two bars, one for leashes destined for the central panel and one for holding the leashes for the borders. For double weave, it can be a good idea to forgo headling bars altogether and thread the pattern shafts directly at the back of the loom. For this piece, with its variety of threadings, I decided to take a hybrid approach that proved a lifesaver down the road. Let's look at the drawdown again to get an overview before heading to the loom. Here's the profile for our damask scarf with its basket weave stripes and framed motifs, with the leashes shown as black squares in their final configuration on 17 pattern shafts. The leashes fall conveniently into three groups. The first group, on the four shafts at the bottom here, are for the units that will be weaving the vertical stripes. Each stripe is either 7 or 10 units wide and will require an identical number of leashes. Each stripe is arranged on two pattern shafts for maximum efficiency. Three repeated points are associated with the symmetrical motifs at either edge and the center of the pattern. Two more repeated points allow for some variation in each row. Each of these leashes will also be connected to a single unit draw cord, allowing me to add Easter eggs to my design. 
I decided to arrange these leashes in a logical way for threading so that mistakes would be easy to catch and distribution to the pattern shafts would be as painless as possible. Here's what I came up with. The back of the loom is at the top and the front of the loom is at the bottom. Since there aren't too many of them, I'm going to thread all the leashes for the vertical stripes directly onto their pattern shafts. The repeated points will be threaded onto two headling bars for subsequent distribution using the mirror head method. These shaft and headling bars will be hung at the back of the loom in the order that makes most sense for my distribution strategy. Let's look at the leashes destined for the pattern shafts that will be closest to me when I am weaving. If we count all the leashes, we find that there are 11 of them. So I will place 11 leashes on that pattern shaft and hang it in front of the others, closest to the beater. I will thread those leashes in the order required by my plan. On the next shaft bar, there will be 16 leashes. That bar will be hung behind the first and threaded in situ as well. The third shaft bar will have 11 leashes and the fourth 16. That's all the leashes for my basket weave stripes. The repeated points consist of 11 units each. These three points come next. I will place all 33 of their leashes on a single headling bar for threading. This bar will hang behind the four shaft bars. The second group of points will be threaded on the second headling bar nearest to the back beam. Having these two points separated from the rest will make it easy for me to connect the single unit draw cords when the time comes. My six X units will also be threaded on the second headling bar. It will be a simple task to separate those onto their own pattern shaft at the rear of the pack when everything else is done. Remarkably, if I add all these numbers together, I get 115, the exact number of units in my design. By pre-counting my leashes and having them on the correct bar before I start threading, I'll be able to catch mistakes while I work without fear of impending doom. And there's one more thing I can do to ease my pain down the road. As I'm threading, I will mark the central unit of each point to serve as a reference when I am redistributing leashes. Since I'm counting like crazy anyway, it makes sense to identify these early in the game rather than trying to count at the back beam later on. Let's sally forth to the loom to see how this strategy works in action. Here we are standing at the rear of the loom, which is just as we left it at the end of my previous video. We are examining our warp ends as they cross through the least sticks. You may remember that when I was winding the warp, I held three threads in my hand for a 3x3 three three cross. You can clearly see that configuration of threads here. It is going to help us enormously in the tasks to come. To keep things in order, I've secured the rear leaf stick to the back beam. I've hung my four shafts and two headling bars from the cross piece on the extension. I've got my leashes pre-counted. They are hanging in groups held together by painter's tape with the tally for each group written on. Here's my threading draft flipped upside down to reflect our perspective looking towards the front of the loom. The two points at the rearmost of the setup are all threaded here on the headling bar closest to me, with the X-shaft units too. That should be 28 leashes and so it is. The rest of the repeated points are on the headling bar directly in front, 33. The remaining units will be threaded onto their four shafts in situ, with no need for redistribution later on. You'll see how awesomely easy this makes things in a bit. For now, it means I'll be threading six bars according to my draft, and only the rearmost two bars will have leashes that need to be moved onto pattern shafts after the warp has been tied on. And we're off. Sitting inside the extension makes threading the heddles a quick and comfortable enterprise. Here, I've threaded the X-shaft units on the rearmost headling bar and tied them together so I don't get confused if I lose count. There are three X-units on either side of the piece. Here are the three associated leashes. I know that when I've threaded both sets of ends in my 3x3 three three cross that it's time to move on to the next leash. And if I'm in the middle of a leash, then I need to recheck where I've gone astray. But so far, so good. 
Now it's time to move on to the first group of units here. For the first vertical basket weave stripe that will be threaded on the rearmost of the four shafts at the front of my setup. One unit on the forward shaft, two on the one behind, and so on, until these seven units have been threaded. I separate out those leashes on their two shafts and get to work, holding six threads in my hands at a time and threading with my fingers. You get into quite a groove. When these seven units have been threaded, I turn my attention to the next eleven. These are on the first of the two headling bars, the one closest to me. I thread them as before and mark the middle unit with a piece of yarn to make it easy to find when I need to redistribute my pattern shafts later on. We'll speed things up a bit and... That's done. Here are the first several groups of leashes after they've been threaded. Here's my X units on the rearmost headling bar. Here's the first vertical basket weave stripe on their two pattern shafts. Mm, here. Here's the 11 units of the first point on the foremost headling bar with its central unit marked in green. Next comes the second basket weave stripe on the frontmost two shafts. Here's the second point on the rearmost headling bar with a green marker as before. Eventually, each of these units will have single draw cords attached as well, and so on, carefully following our threading draft until all the leashes are complete. And here are all my leashes threaded up. You can see the basket weave units on the four shafts at the front and the repeated points on the two headling bars behind them, all ready for redistribution onto their pattern shafts several steps down the road. But we still have a whole nother set of heddles to thread, the long eye heddles, which will live on the six ground shafts. This process also takes place at the back of the loom. I'm using my countermarch, so I hang my ground shafts from that and shift the whole lot towards the back beam until it is situated just in front of the pattern leashes. Then I get to work. The threading of the long eye heddles is a relatively mindless process, I find, since it is a straight threading all the way across the warp. One, two, three, four, five, six, from the rearmost shaft to the foremost one, with one repeat per pattern leash. It's pretty easy to catch mistakes, and if I do find the final thread of the leash doesn't accord with the end of my repeat, a quick count of the heddles on top of the bars can show me the mistake pretty quickly. And soon, all my long eye heddles are threaded. I tie up and remove the leftover heddles and stand back to admire the glory. Now I'm almost ready to move the countermarch to the front of the loom, but before I do that there's one more thing to do. I have to slay my reed. I suspend it from the countermarch in front of the ground shafts, with the center roughly where it needs to be, and the rightmost edge of the warp marked. And off I go. Immediately after starting to slay my reed, I realized that my original set of 40 ends per inch was a bit too dense, so I adjusted on the fly to roughly 36 ends per inch, or 2 ends per dent in a 70-10 metric reed. It looked much better. As I slay, I knot the warp in groups so my hard work isn't undone if things suddenly go haywire and the whole thing goes crashing to the floor. I'm not sure why, but I really enjoy this part of the process, and it is always over way too quickly. When the reed is slayed, I undo the cords from which it is hanging and let the whole thing fall onto the knotted warp. Of course, I check the integrity of the knots before I take this drastic step. Fun and games next. We now have to move the countermarch with the reed and ground shafts dangling wildly from it back to the front of the loom from here to here. <laughs> 
The first few times I did this maneuver, I made sure I had help standing by, but now I can do it myself, slowly, inch by inch. I loosened the ratchet on the warp beam and carefully inched the whole lot forwards, stopping to lift up the draw loom attachment so it doesn't get tangled up with the jacks on the counter march. I moved back and forth to either side of the loom, nudging the counter march forward and making sure nothing gets caught until finally I am able to mount the reed in the beater. The loom can be in disarray after this maneuver, so I like to do a walk round to make sure the drawbridge shims are in place, the cords are going over the correct pulleys and are not tangled in the jacks, the cords for the support bars are where they need to be, the pattern shaft cords are hanging freely, and no warp threads were broken during the kerfuffle. This all looks good to me, so I'm ready to tie the warp to the cloth beam. Here's my tie-on bar with its cords going from the cloth beam, over the knee beam, and under the breast beam to the reed. I align the center of the bar with the center of the beater and make sure the cords are on the marks showing where they need to be. I start tying on in the middle of the warp, knotting the ends in bunches of about one inch each. I am careful to be consistent. Before I tie my knots, I make sure the group of ends that is closest to the end of the bar goes over the tie-on rod. I'm using a simple overhand knot, which I tighten while holding my thumb on the edge of the bar. I work outwards from side to side. If I find that I am losing tension on the center threads, I tighten the warp by cranking the cloth beam a click or two before continuing. In no time at all, I have a well-tensioned warp running from the cloth beam through the reed, through the ground heddles and the pattern leashes, all the way to the warp beam. It looks great, and I'm satisfied. We're in the home stretch, but there's one more thing I like to do at this point before the inside of the loom gets filled up with pattern shafts, leashes, and dangly lingos. I tie up my lambs and treadles so much easier at this stage of the proceedings while there's room to work. On my vertical countermarch, I always tie up my long, lifty lambs first. But before I can do that, I need to install some elastics to ensure the ground shafts snap back to neutral when their treadles are released. I use the same buttonhole elastic I use for my counterbalance setups, with a piece of Texol and a pointy connector for each group of three elastics. I've got six long lambs, and I'll need two elastics each, twelve in total. The first two groups I hang from this cross piece so that when the lambs are inserted, they are held roughly parallel with the floor. I can fine-tune these elastics when the treadle tie-up is complete. The second group of elastics is attached to the bottom of the gable, with the lambs inserted thusly for added stability. There are other strategies for achieving the same result using elastics or weights attached to the countermarch jacks. But I find this method is simple and effective and does not add too much resistance against which to treadle. Here we are, all done. While I'm down here, I take the opportunity to attach the lambs to the countermarch jacks. You can see I rely on my loyal assistant for this important step. I secure the lambs so that they are more or less parallel to the floor. Next, I position myself inside the loom to hook up the short, sinky lambs to the lower shaft bars of my ground shafts. I attach them so they are parallel to, or angle slightly above, the lower lambs. And there we go. With the last one. Now it's time to drop the cords for my treadle tie-up. With six ground shafts and a countermarch, I have loads of possible structures to choose from. For this piece, I'm going to use a six-shaft satin variation found in the book Warp and Weft. I really love it. It's a structure that looks like it's made of tiny little flowers, and I thought it would be perfect for my scarf.
All the other possibilities scribbled on this page would be great. And as soon as I've got my notes in some sort of presentable order, I'll be doing a video about these. But this is the one I'm setting up today. I use the Vavstuga tie-up method, which involves precisely cut lengths of cord topped with black or white beads. Black beads are for the connections to sinking shafts, and white beads are for connections to rising shafts, reflecting the convention for many Swedish weaving drafts. I always start with the shaft furthest away from me, with a connection to the associated short sinky lamb. I drop it to the correct treadle and make sure the cord goes in front of the corresponding long lamb. A white beaded cord goes into that next. And those are the only two connections I need for each ground shaft. I continue on dropping black and white cords for the rest of my connections. When I'm done, this looks remarkably like this, where black beads are X's and white beads are O's. I move to the front of the loom and attach the treadles to the waiting cords. I have long legs and it's important in the draw loom not to pull the shafts down too far. So I tie the treadles up so their bottoms are about four and a half inches off the floor. This means the lower shaft bars will just kiss the loom's gables when the treadle reaches the floor. We'll examine this requirement more closely when we fine tune the shed in a later video. We've accomplished a lot today, and I think we've earned a break. If this were a single harness loom, we'd be almost ready to throw the shuttle. But we are intrepid draw loom weavers, and still have a few things left to do. In my next video, we'll distribute the pattern leashes and set up the single unit draw cords. After that, we'll fine tune the shed and weave our piece until it's done. I hope you'll join me.